If you haven't done so yet, please pause the video and try to solve the question on your own before listening on. Because of the presence of two batteries, we're going to have to use Kirchhoff's rules to solve this circuit problem. Now, one of Kirchhoff's rule is known as the junction rule, and a junction is simply where the circuit sort of splits into a T-shape. So for example, right here would be a junction. Now, according to the junction rule, the total current flowing into the junction will equal the total current flowing out of the junction. If we look at the diagram carefully, we can see that I2 has been drawn flowing into the junction. So we could include I2 on the left side of this equation. I3 and I1, on the other hand, are flowing out of the junction. So we can put those two on the right-hand side and just add a plus sign between them. So this becomes our first equation, and we're going to hold on to it and use it later. We will next have to use Kirchhoff's loop rule. And to use the loop rule, what you need to do is to pick an arbitrary starting point within the circuit, and then you're going to want to follow a continuous path around a portion of the circuit until you return back to where you started. So for example, this could be one loop right here. Now, when we move around the loop, we want to keep track of the potential changes. And that will occur when we pass through a battery as well as a resistor. So for example, when we begin to move around our loop, we encounter this battery. Notice that we would be moving from the negative to the positive terminal of the battery. And in that case, that is a positive potential change equal to the potential of the battery. So we would have a positive 5.0 volts worth of a potential change. We would then continue around the loop until we encounter this resistor. Notice that we would be moving with the current. When you're moving with current, that is a negative potential change. Furthermore, that potential change through a resistor is equal to the resistance times the current. So we would take the resistance of 1 ohm and multiply it by the current marked I2. We would then continue along the loop and encounter this resistor right here. Notice that we would be moving with the current marked I3. Again, that's a negative potential change equal to the resistance, which was 2.8 ohms, times the current through that resistor, which was I3. We then continue our way through the loop until we return to our starting point, and at that point we can set the total potential changes equal to zero. This is a second equation that we're going to be using later. Now we're going to use the loop rule one more time, and we can start at this point and move around the loop of the bottom section of the circuit, again keeping track of potential changes. So moving from the negative to the positive terminal of a battery is a positive potential change equal to the 5 volts of that battery. Moving through this resistor, we'll notice that we're flowing or moving against the direction of the current. If you follow I1 through the circuit, you can see that as we move around the green loop, we're moving against current I1. So that's a positive potential change, and it's equal to that resistance of 1 ohm times the current of I1. And then continuing around the green loop, we would encounter this resistor. We're moving against the current marked I2. Again, that's a positive potential change, equal to the resistance times the current, so 1 ohm times the current of I2. Then we come to this battery, and in this case, as we go around the green loop, we're moving from the positive terminal to the negative terminal of the battery. That's a negative potential change. So we'll have a minus 5 volts. And then we return to where we started so we could set these potential changes equal to 0. Notice that the 5 and the minus 5 will actually cancel each other out. So we can simplify this equation. And so we are left with three equations and three unknowns. And so now the problem turns into some algebra. The key in doing this is to try to generate an equation that contains just one of the three unknowns. And it's usually easiest to leave the first equation, the junction rule equation, alone, and then try to solve the other two equations for one of the variables. It's kind of hard to articulate without actually going through it. So one way of proceeding through this in this particular case is to solve the bottom equation here for I1. So we'll subtract I2 from both sides, and we can see that I1 is equal to negative I2. We'll hold on to that equation and we'll see why that's useful in a moment. Let's solve this equation for I3, and to do that we can add the 2.8 I3 over to the right side. And then we can divide each term of the equation by 2.8. So now we have the equation solved for I3. Now the reason this is important is notice that I3 is solved in terms of I2, and I1 is also solved in terms of I2. And that's basically your goal with the loop rule equations is to solve so that the equations are in terms of the same variable, in this case I2. So now we go back to the junction rule equation and for I1 we're going to substitute in the negative I2 
And for i3, we're going to substitute in this expression right here. Okay, so to solve for i2, we can add this i2 term over to the left side. We could also add this term, this i2 over 2.8 over to the left side. Now this might look a little confusing, just remember that there's a 1 up here in the numerator, so you can divide that 1 by 2.8. You could then add these like terms together, and then divide by the 2.357. And I2 turns out to be approximately 0.758 amps. So this would be the correct answer for I2. Now nicely, the other currents, I3 and I1, were solved in terms of I2. So all you need to do is go back and plug in for I2 into this equation as well as that equation. Now, when you do that, you can see that I3 turns out to have a value of positive 1.52 amps, so that is the correct answer. I1 turns out to have a negative value. Now, you can't have negative currents in these circuit problems, but all that means is you have to go back to the picture and just simply reverse the direction that we originally had drawn. Well, actually, they originally drew it. So we're going to cross off the direction of being downward and just switch it to being upward. So in fact, current I1 should have been flowing in that way. And then once you switch the direction of the current, you can drop this minus sign. So you don't have to do any further calculation. You just have to go back and change the direction in the picture. So I1 turns out to have the value of 0.758 amps. Thanks for taking the time to watch the video. If you liked it, please click the thumbs up icon and subscribe to the channel so you can stay tuned for other videos. Remember, you can send in your own question to this email address and I'll do my best to answer it on YouTube.